But for the safety of the American people and for peace in the world, Saddam Hussein will be disarmed one way or the other. Saddam Hussein and his sons must leave Iraq within 48 hours. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. <laughs> الجيش العراقي احنا تركنا اسلحتنا برضاتنا زين قلنا نخلص من الطاغيه اجتنا ناس اكثر من هذا طاغيه هي امريكا When President Bush was saying these words 20 years ago on March 19th 2003 the first US aircraft were already bombing targets in Iraq A few hours later the ground forces of the international coalition went into action Thus began the Second Gulf War, which was to have disastrous consequences not only for Iraq itself, but for the entire Middle East. The invasion led not only to the destruction of Saddam Hussein's regime, but above all to the destruction of Iraqi statehood. The complete collapse of public institutions and the ensuing chaos led to a bloody civil war and the infiltration of Iraq by the neighboring Islamic Republic of Iran. The chaos in Mesopotamia was also quickly exploited by terrorists, who a few years after Saddam's overthrow raised the black flags of the Islamic State over swathes of Iraq and Syria. Iraq in a few decades went from being a regional power to a failed state. Today we look at Iraq from the perspective of 20 years after the toppling of Saddam Hussein. How has Iraq changed in the past two decades? Where is Iraq today? And where is it heading? Until the 1970s, Iraq, with a thriving economy and a strong army, was a key player in the Middle East. Saddam Hussein's adventurous foreign policy, however, collapsed Iraq's potential. First, Hussein spent eight years in a bloody war with Iran. Then, he invaded Kuwait, which led to US military intervention and heavy sanctions on Iraq. Domestic perturbations also accompanied international problems. The country's economy collapsed, and Shia and Kurdish resistance to Hussein's rule began to grow. By the end of Saddam's rule, Iraq was a mere shadow of its former 1970s power. However, the real nail in the coffin for Iraq was the 2003 invasion. It not only brought the end of Saddam Hussein's rule, but also completely dismantled the Iraqi state. In May 2003, a little over a month after the fall of Baghdad, Paul Bremer, President Bush's special envoy for Iraq and head of the occupation authority, arrived in Iraq. The Americans wanted to eliminate high-ranking members of the Ba'ath Party, which had ruled Iraq since 1968, from political life. Bremer did not stop at destroying the Ba'ath Party. His second order, as the head of the occupation forces, was the decision to disband the Iraqi armed forces which numbered around 300,000 troops on the eve of the invasion. These two decisions by Bremer, the start of the debaification and the disbanding of the Iraqi armed forces, resulted in a total of nearly 750,000 Iraqis losing their jobs overnight, with unemployment in the country rising to 60%. Bremer's colleagues warned him from the beginning about the consequences of such a repressive policy. However, Bremer remained unmoved, claiming that he was only carrying out Washington's orders. The head of the CIA cell in Baghdad, Charles Seidel, who had warned Bremer was particularly harsh about the debification plans and said, quote, If you do that, you will not be able to govern this country. By the time the sun rises over Baghdad, you will have 50,000 insurgents in the city. Unquote. Time has shown that Seidel was right. The disbanding of the Iraqi army and the debuffification policy led to a rise to anti-American sentiment and gave rise to an armed insurgency against the occupation forces. The first to take arms were the Sunnis. Since the creation of the Kingdom of Iraq in 1921, they have been the political elite of the country. This was also the case under Saddam. The 2003 invasion, however, completely reversed this situation. The debuffification affected primarily the Sunnis, pushing them to the margins of political life in post-Saddam Iraq. 
The Sunnis' resentment towards the Americans was all the greater because after 2003 most of the power in the country went to the Kurds and Shiites. Tensions between Iraq's various ethno-religious groups have admittedly existed since the establishment of the state in 1921. Over the years there have also been Shiite and Kurdish rebellions against the central government. Yet there have been attempts, more or less successful, to create a common Iraqi national identity. The Americans, on the other hand, led to a situation in which the political and social order was primarily based on sectarian affiliations, that is, membership of the Shiite, Sunni or Kurdish communities. As a result of US policy as early as the summer of 2003, the Sunnis who felt more embittered by the post-Saddam reality took up arms and began to organize guerrillas. The epicenter of this rebellion was in the so-called Sunni Triangle, that is the area between Ramadi, Baghdad and Tikrit. Initially, the Americans tried to portray the rebels as sympathizers of the Hussein regime. However, in the early 2004, the Mahdi army joined the rebellion. Muqtada al-Sadr, a member of a respected Shiite clan, led it. While the Sunni rebels could be accused of sympathizing with Saddam, this argument did not work in Sadr's case. After all, his father, Ayatollah Muhammad al-Sadr, like many other Shiite clerics, was killed by Saddam's men in the 1990s. Thus, less a year after Saddam's overthrow, the Americans found themselves in a situation where they had to fight both Sunnis and Shiites. Just around the corner, meanwhile, lurked another enemy, the jihadists. Quote, ISIS is another incarnation of Al-Qaeda in Iraq that emerged as a result of our invasion. This is an example of unintended consequences. Therefore, in general, we should aim first and shoot later. Barack Obama, year 2015. 